everybody. Good uh, morning, good afternoon, or whatever, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the net.lol podcast. My name is Tom Nato. I'm one of the co-hosts of the program. Here, joined with uh, my other co-hosts, uh, Mr. Salisbury, Mr. Tucker, and Kyle Mestri. Um, we're back here for part do- two with uh, Mr. Shane Ronan uh, from Red Hat. Uh, Shane was previously on the show, I don't know, two or three weeks ago, uh, talking about the sort of operator angle around 5G and general, how to build networks, uh, why networks are still important, and what the open source angle is uh, around that. So welcome back to the show, Shane. Thanks for having, Thanks for having me. Coming back on. So what, since we, since we talked last time, I guess, um, I, we ended off... <clears throat> Um, this isn't meant to be like a continuous, anybody listening, a contiguous part one to part two. Um, we're actually recording this separately, by the way, <laughs> from part one. But where we left off last time, um, I guess we were we ended off kind of near the 5G edge is where we were talking about and what the, uh, you know, kind of operational complications are around there. And then just we we're just about to get into like mech and 5G and then um, maybe we can talk about ORAN after that as well. Sure. So, where, sure. where you know, what, what are your thoughts on that on the edge and 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 where 5G is going? And you know, should we go back to everything in a box, or is this big as disaggregated <laughs> thing still working? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a, it's an interesting question. The the disaggregated edge, um, or you know, the, the the virtualization of the edge is in concept, a great idea, right? So today, uh, the edge is, you know, custom-built boxes that sit at the edge and uh, power your cell sites, and, uh, you know, they're monolithic and they're proprietary, somewhat proprietary to a vendor. Uh, with virtualization, the promise is that I can dis de-aggregate the pieces that, that make up that, that purpose-built box Virtualize them on on uh, you know COTS hardware, commercial off the shelf servers, and provide lower cost, better interoperability, and more flexibility. The reality on the other hand, yeah, I was going to say, is, what's the reality? Because that was my different. experience. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even like you just mentioned Cogs, and I twitched a little bit because mixing and matching parts in COGS machines, you know, people listening have this sort of misconception that it's all mix and match. It really isn't, right? I mean, it's... No, of course not. Of course not. I mean, it's... it's the the promise is much greater than the, the reality. Um, you know, so today I have a single box and everything I need comes in that box. So even from an operational perspective, Alerting, alarming, metrics all come out of a single box. Even well, if they're now when I virtualize from different right. groups at that company, they're all integrated to work together, right? Exactly. So now when I go to virtualization, I have to figure out how to uh, take physical hardware alerts, physical hardware metrics, network overlay metrics, software metrics, software alerts, and correlate those, right? So yep. that's just one of the many problems that happens when you go to virtualization and, and, and uh, from, a, from a, you know, and disaggregation. Well, just a but, correlation well, thing you're talking about. I was, I was working on this myself last week about what happens when two vendors show up and, well, I mean, the two vendors show up in that stack with different message bus integrations or even the same message bus integration, but with a different different you know right. that was one thing we you know i bumped into myself and the other was um well i mentioned it earlier like good luck just swapping nicks in into these different machines too <laughs> right i mean right uh i just got brand new hot off the press machines that um you know i, I got a bunch of intel machines with uh pensando nicks in them nothing works and it's not a you know smack against either of those companies or anything it's just that it's a it's a narrative right of what it is it's it's an integration thing right and so now i went in and went oh the drivers don't work for this 
they're fixing these, but there's some out of tree patches. You can, you know, blah, 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 blah. Here we go again. Right. <laughs> right. We, we, right, we've so. been here before. Right. And, and that's what, that's why we have Vertio, right. And then that's supposed to like solve that problem. Right. And unless I miss something, but I, I guess I'm curious about this idea of, so you virtualize it, right. And now you've got all of these other things and that uh, creates a problem, but are these things still black box? Because it kind of reminds me of uh, building multi-vendor networks, right? You'd have a, a router from Juniper and a router from Cisco. They both talk OSPF, and OSPF's the standard, so like that should be fine. Are we not at that point within the 5G stack where we've got black box things from different vendors, whether they're open source or not, that we're integrating through like common standards, or is it just like of the wild west? So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> And I know that that's a, a, a non-answer, but let me take a step back, right? So we discussed, we talked last time about the 5G core um, and the disaggregation of the 5G core. Uh, or if, and so when we move into the 5G edge, there's also disaggregation. So t traditionally in a baseband, you have a control plane and a data plane. So in 5G, we've, we've split the two out into a CU, a control unit and a data unit. And the control unit usually runs in the central location, probably back where your 5G core is running. And what you're running at the edge is the DU, the distributed unit or the data unit. It stands for distributed unit, but it's essentially the data plane. Okay, so that's really all that needs to run at the edge from a software perspective. Um, Don't forget the all antennas well good, that are again. connected to that thing too. Everybody forgets right. about that. <laughs> right. You don't need antennas, Tom. It'll be fine. Well, you also need a radio, right? <laughs> and, and a so radio the long-term promise that, is that we right. actually can virtualize the RU or the radio unit. Really not there yet. But we still have a physical radio that's connected via something called eCIPRI, which is basically radio protocol over Ethernet. So that's when we get into the issues with the NICs and why VirtIO doesn't really work for this because yep. I need to do essentially SRIOV directly to the NIC in order to get the speeds that I need out. But taking even a further step back. So today I have this physical unit at the edge that I'm now gonna de-aggregate into, again, a physical box, so a Dell server, right? And then I'm gonna run some sort of operating system on that server. So in the case of OpenShift, let's call it core OS. And then I'm gonna run, you know, my, my platform on it. So call it OpenShift, single node OpenShift, right? Standalone OpenShift box. And on top of OpenShift, I've got OVN, Open Virtual Network. And on top of that, I have my software from Ericsson, my, my virtual DU. That's the onboard software. Some of it's offboard too, right? Running on Correct. other machines that are nearby. Right. Well, let's just assume that those are the pieces right. that I have, right? Yeah. So I went from having one box that did all of this, and it all came from one vendor, to now having at least three or four vendors in the stack, right? And so without even talking about standards, right? Cause we haven't even got into the actual application level standards. How do I take the, you know, alerts, metrics, data from each of those pieces of the puzzle and correlate them, right? Because what if I have a dim go bad in the physical Dell server, but that's actually causing errors at the core OS level that's sending out. So core OS is sending out alarm saying, you know, I've got check some errors or something like that. But how do I correlate that to the actual root cause? Right? And when something breaks, whose throat do I choke? Because today as an operator, when that baseband, that, that single purpose built box breaks, I call the vendor who built it and say, hey, fix it. So from an operator perspective, the biggest challenge here is not the standards, it's not deploying the hardware, it's actually the operational perspective, it's the integration. Who owns the responsibility well, and for don't, that stack? Don't, folks listening, don't think that just because there's an integrator in the, in the middle, a real integrator like Tech Mahindra or somebody, that the problem's solved either. They basically just move that problem over to them that Shane just described, right? They still have to deal with that. It's, right. you know, it's just rather than the platform vendor or the operator, somebody's got to deal with this. That's the point. There's no free lunch, right? We're just moving and the And in the case of Verizon, somewhere. Verizon chose not to use an integrator and become the integrator themselves. Yep. 
they decided that it was smarter for them to own that integration. But now they no longer have a single throat to choke. So when that cell site goes down and a 911 call fails and somebody well, they have their own throat to choke. Passes, <laughs> who do, who do they, whose responsibility is it? Before they could right. basically just say, Erickson, you know, I'm passing the lawsuit on to you. Now Verizon <laughs> as an operator is on the hook for that. So that's the biggest, the first biggest challenge. And I think Dave, the next challenge that you identified is interoperability. So while there are standards, just like with OSPF, there are different implementations, right? So that's the next biggest challenge is if I have a, uh, a CU, the control unit from Ericsson and a DU from Samsung, while they should work together because they're using the same standards, they might not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's, you know, that's the kind of interesting thing that we've, we've always had this problem, but we've sorted it out ahead of time because it was like a, almost like a single integration, right? You would park your router back to back with, at one of the labs or in your own lab and you'd figure out, you know, because folks listening, st standards might get you, might get you 80% of common bits right and and protocol and stuff might but even then and that's the best case usually and you've still got 20 percent you've got to go figure out where people have added extensions and whatever and that's that's the hairy you know part of the the equation with the, the the toughest part of the integrations are because that's where the vendors are trying to actually add value that differentiates from someone else and they're on purpose don't necessarily want to integrate you know and now you've got this also multiplied by at least three different layers of integration that you described too. That's the other point. It's kind of an N by M thing. Right. So, so what and, I'd be and curious, not to jump ahead. Well, oh, sorry, one, Kyle, thing I'd ahead. Be curious, one thing I'd be curious about, uh, Shane, and also Tom, honestly, is how much of this integration stuff is solved by, by Amazon and Google and Azure getting into this and saying, you know, run all your stuff on on Amazon, right? You know, we, we, we can do it, either run it in the public cloud or in Amazon's case, here's like an outpost. There you go, right? Just run it on there. I mean, does that, are you seeing these people, you know, the hyperscalers getting into this market and starting to try to compete? And on top of that bottom layer, are they just gonna go up market, up stack too, and say, <laughs> you know what? Well, and the answer is absolutely they are. And absolutely they are moving up the stack. Um, so the only commercial uh, RAN deployment that's happening on the public cloud that I'm aware of is Dish Networks. So Dish Networks contracted right. with Amazon. They're going to host their entire environment in Amazon, completely virtualized RAN, completely virtualized core. What I can tell you is, it, is that it's easier said than done. Um, but it does solve the problem of the multi-layer integration. Because Amazon or Azure or whoever they're the is integrated, going to take, right? Right, right. They're going to take care of that that whole stack from the hardware through the operating system and the platform, and do the correlation for you. So then you only have to worry about the application level uh, well, alarms. That, but the the that comes at a price. You have other things to worry about. Being you're locked into that stack now, so you've you've got it working and it works. But good luck going somewhere else, right? Yeah. So, you know, uh, straight on. Right. But I can tell you that the, the, the Dish Networks deployment is, uh, it's been a challenge for them and they're continuing. Well, to they've be been working on that for how long now? It must be two years? At least two years, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. But the Upstack integration that you're referring to is, is, uh, is something that Microsoft has actually invested very heavily in. Um, so in the last year, Microsoft has actually bought two different uh, 5G application vendors. Um, and their goal is to actually provide the entire stack um, all the way through from the hosting all the way through the application level. And that's a little different, though, than what, you know, like uh, also folks listening may not appreciate the fact that the different big cloud vendors have different approaches to this, right? They're actually fairly different. I mean, when you compare Amazon and Azure, uh, well, AT, you know, I mean, sorry, not at t Azure and, and Amazon and Google, they all have different approaches to what you just said, like how far up the stack they're going to go, how much integration are they going to do? 
right. and all of that, right? And where in the market they want to be. Um, yeah. Because Google's actually taken a different approach and is uh, attacking the, the, the RAND market by actually getting into the spectrum business. So uh, there they became what's known as a SaaS, a spectrum allocation service provider for uh, public spectrum as well as the obviously the cloud provider so they're, they're kind of trying to play a more services oriented right where they can provide value-added services on top of the cloud microsoft wants to own the entire stack and in fact at&t has turned over their entire uh 5g core yep. network to at&t to operate for them uh yep. that they, their virtualized network that they had built on the core side and amazon just wants to be the platform right so each of them and are taking like in a very different case, approach. They actually even have their whole OSS they're taking, right? Correct. It, Correct. I mean, that's back to the operational angle here. That's that's one of the the kind of often overlooked things in this. I mean, we keep talking about this giant stack that needs to be worked and operated and installed and managed and cared and fed, but that's the elephant in the room, you know, is how do you do that? And that's part of it, like the... Um, the very opinionated stack approach, I guess I'll call it, you know, like here are two or three options. They're integrated soup to nuts, they work. And there are other options which are very loosely integrated. Like you said, there's here's a platform, here's a bunch of pieces. We don't know if it'll work or not, but let's give it a try. <laughs> which is very similar to like what the, the, the big vendors are doing, the platform vendors kind of, right? Right. Yeah, well, I would think the hyperscalers would want to take some of those operational efficiencies and apply that to a market like 5G. And that's, you know, that's what they're probably trying to do. And I think Shane, to your point, it, it probably just depends on how advanced each of them are in a specific area or where in the stack they want to try to attack it to differentiate. Because at the end of the day, if they're gonna go after this market, all of them, they, they have to differentiate probably a bit as well. And I didn't but realize the Google point. thing with the spectrum. That That's interesting to me that Google's going after that angle. Yeah, but that's a it good also point, has Kyle, to do too. With, like, go ahead, sorry. Uh, it also has to do with who they want to compete with, right? Because Amazon has made it very clear that they don't want to compete with their customers, um, whereas Microsoft has made it very clear that they're okay with competing with their customers, and that's always been their business model, right? They don't, they don't, yep. they'll eat And Google, too, dogs. a bit, right? Google, right. No, effectively... They're kind of in the middle of the two, you know, in a lot of ways. Right, that's right? how I would describe it, is they're in the middle of the two. But there's also another um, layer of vendor in this mix that's sort of not on the platform side, but on the operational side of the whole stack. So somebody like Rakuten, um, who wants to own the whole platform, they don't really care where you host it so much but they want to own the whole platform from the software that it runs on all the way through the operational part. So they'll actually yeah. run your entire telephone company, your, your wireless company for you, essentially. Um, you just have to have the business. They'll run the whole network for well, you. Well, but the other thing they do that's, that's important to understand is, and this is, this is in contrast to the AT&T example we just gave, right, where they said, this is our OSS and it has to keep running this way. Like, we need continuity right. of what we're doing. The Rakuten model is throw it all away. We've got, you know, like the Tesla version of operating this network right. kind of thing. This is today's thing. It's hot and super efficient, and that's what we're going to use. That's an important trade-off, right, to consider when you're doing this. Yeah, so Kyle, it might your not point have here. everything you need, you know. <laughs> so Kyle, to your point, there are different, you know, for every different kind of permutation of pieces that you can stick together, whether it be the platform and the software, the platform and the operations, there's somebody, whether it be a hyperscaler or a, a mass integrator who's willing to take on those pieces. However, you know, when you're in the, you know, from my opinion, when you're in the business of being a network provider, handing off your network to somebody else to operate, Seems it's strange. a very interesting position for you to be in, right? Well, I, I was wondering, process? yeah, I was wondering if you were going to get there because it does bring up some interesting things. Like what exactly 
is the service provider offering at that point when they've just offloaded right. their network? And how close are the hyperscalers to just saying, we're just going to eventually be a service? Why aren't we Take just it offering all. itself? Yeah. Like, well, what this are we is doing? analogous to streaming, right? This, this, yeah. I remember having this same argument when I was at BT about, well, if we don't provide the streaming content, we're still selling naked pipes. And that's, this is even worse. They're like, here, take my pipes. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, so, right. you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting question because, you know, Verizon, for example, used to own their own cell towers. They used to own all their cell towers. Um, and in order to raise money to buy out Verizon Wireless from Vodafone, they sold off all the cell towers to a, to a third party company. And this exact yep. same conversation happened then. Well, if we don't own our cell towers, what do we own? What do we own? Right? Because basically at that point, they were a real estate company, right? An operating real estate company. They said, well, we're a network company, right? So we're not a real estate company, we're a network company. Um, but if they were to turn around and turn their network over to somebody, which in the case of Verizon, they haven't done, they've made the choice to operate it themselves and be the integrator. What's their value proposition at that point? Are they just a, uh, you know, a back office provider? Sub you know? Subscriber management or so? Well, that's right. like the, the Rocketon model you just gave. Like if you combine the two of those things together, Suddenly, there's nothing left except subscriber management, <laughs> and then what do you well, sell which, ads or something? Right. In the case of Dish Networks, that's essentially what they want to be. Right. They don't really want to operate a cell phone company. They're looking to, you know, it's be a value kind of like another provider. streaming service or something that adds on right. to what they sell. Yeah, it's just another upsell, kind of, right? right? Another, which is weird. Right. Which, is, which you know, in the case of Spectrum, for example. Spectrum sells cell phone service, but they don't own a cell phone network, right? They basically just, they're a mobile virtual network operator and they just sell Verizon cell phone service. but And they sell it cheap because it's a value proposition to lock customers into their cable service, right? It's another add-on. So I think, you know, we're kind of getting off of where we were going, but from an operator perspective, you know, you get into the question of what is an operator at this point, right? Because, you know, what what does it mean to be an operator? <laughs> because in some cases, yeah. some of these operators may not be operating their own network. Um, right. Is it support? Is it billing? And then what's left? You know, right. So getting back to the edge, um, you know, Kyle, the, the the next kind of step in what you were describing, or I think it was Dave, I think asked about the the standardization, and I apologize, I don't remember. Is you know, and, and Tom touched on it at the beginning, is uh, is the ORAN consortium. So, can you, know, you just remind are, everybody what that is, just before yeah, we so jump in? So, ORAN into it. Is, a, is, a, is a shorthand for Open RAN, which is basically taking the the network as we as it exists today and opening it up into multiple components and, uh, in, you know, supporting the interoperability and, and, and standards uh, at the at the very edge of the radio access network. So, where Open RAN is the concept, ORAN is the actual uh, open source consortium of people, operators, platform providers, uh, equipment providers, coming together to try to build kind of more robust standards for interoperability. Um, and that goes from, you know, it's more like a best practices kind of thing. Like, how would you do it? Here's the, you know, versus like, a, you know, ITU standard or whatever. I, yeah, it's, ITU it's very standard. similar to like an Etsy, um, you know, where, like where operational. We're Right, thing uh, it's a, spec yeah. or something. Uh, rather than a three GPP who's saying this is what the message must look like, ORAN is going and saying, okay, so you have a network. How do we truly make multiple vendors interoperate together? And that goes from, you know, all the way from the actual, uh, tra you know, message transport that's going to be used for for alerting to how the cloud platform itself will. Uh, except, uh, you know, different formats of of instantiation and alerting, and it, and it runs the entire gamut of the entire Just implementation best practice. Like we're working on one now about security and penetration testing and stuff like that over here, and it's it's kind of like a guide of these are the things you must not let happen, and these are the things you must watch out for, and that kind of thing. But it's not a spec, but isn't the front hall 
for example, interface, that's more of a yes. spec, right? Right. So there's a front hall SIPRI spec, right? Of this is what the you know this is what front hall must look like. It's a physical connection, and this is what it must look like. However, Oren is saying, okay, on top of that, let's discuss how the different message transports and how extensions will work so that even if you implement an extension on top of the specification, it won't, it'll be backwards compatible. And, um, you know, the real promise there is that you basically can take any equipment from any vendor, plug it together and it will work. Right. So, you know, we kind of discussed that that exists in the specs. However, different people implement the specs differently. There's no testing to ensure that there's, Compliance like specs. <laughs> the idea with ORAN is that if you're ORAN compliant and you claim that you're ORAN compliant, it should just work. Um, but what does that mean? You know? Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, and isn't that the overarching kind of goal of ORAN, anyways, is to find you know those compatibilities, let vendors work towards you know common, a common infrastructure where they can plug in and out. And right. I think on yeah, the on the consumer side, the advantage is here's here's this commoditization of these you know vertical deployments they used to uh, or at least uniformity boxes. of operation for the operators the thing at the beginning right at least yeah, but that's good one. Yeah. The, yeah. the problem however is that it's architecture by committee <laughs> and yeah. pretty much anybody can join the committee um and so by what, the way oran is hosted in the linux succeed. foundation <laughs> right now and so that's you know what shane is saying the the normal rules of open source projects apply the problem with that is that everything and the kitchen sink gets thrown in. So everybody's pet pet project or everybody's pet, you know, proposal kind of gets thrown into the mix. And, you know, one of the problems with it is, is that it doesn't, does it become overly complex by trying to drive to this complete standardization? Do I in fact make it harder to standardize? and less attractive to standardize because in order to be compliant, I have to uh, adhere to these 10,000 different uh, policies and, and procedures. And, you know, having having been part of or being part of, you know, one of the ORAN committees, that's, that's the takeaway that I bring to every meeting is, you know, are we making this impossible to really work because we've thrown everything in the kitchen sink in? Um, so that, that, that might be the case. I've seen a couple of these movies before this one, and that's pretty <laughs> much how it turns out is basically it's an integration exercise with very competing interests. I mean, there's, there's the also the elephant in the room, right? That we haven't addressed yet about the people that are the companies that are part of Voran. There's, there's a, there's at least some, some well-founded paranoia that several of them are not really interested in the thing flying. Right. right. For all the obvious reasons, they want to keep selling their refrigerator sized, you know, racks of, of stuff. But um, and the, and it's always the this is always the case right in these things. I just wonder, like you're saying, like, have they bitten off too much than they can chew? Maybe it's focus on like a very narrow <laughs> slice of this thing and just figure it out. Right. I don't know. Well, Tom, you, you've been here before, right? Like, uh, at least in my my head, like one of the standards bodies that has actually produced usable things is the IETF. And, and that's mm -hmm. been on this ethos of rough consensus and running code. So the idea is don't bore the Asian because you're not going to get anywhere. Like, let's just get my implementation done, your implementation done. And if these implementations work together, then that's good enough for a standard, right? And sure, there's going to be bugs. We're going to revise the spec so it's easier for other people to enter. But, you know, <laughs> hey, it, it works, right? And even the IEEE does this to an extent. You don't get 100 gig Ethernet that doesn't work between vendors. Like, it, it works because we tested it up front when, when we yeah, did the spec. There's a bake-off and there's a spec and you sit down and you run it and you see if it right. does. And that's, that's essentially how the 3GPP works, right? It's, we're not going to dream big. We're going to build something that we know works, and we'll figure out the details later. Yeah. With ORAN, they're trying to figure out – the ORAN is the part where they're trying to figure out the details. And in the process of figuring out All the details – All of the details. As, right. As Tom mentioned, you have competing uh, priorities. So you have people who are not only pushing their, you know, we want this added, 
but there are people saying, you know, voting against things being added because it isn't the way that their product currently works. Right. And they don't yep. want to have to change their product to be compliant. So they're going to say, no, 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 we're not going to do it that way. Um, and everybody involved is guilty. Right. I don't think that there's any uh, innocent party <laughs> in the Everyone's process. Right? Yeah. Um, so that's the long term goal in standardization is, is, is something like ORAN, where you basically can plug and play any component with any other vendor. Um, and because you've standardized the platform, any CNF will run on it. And this is how the mess, you know, this is how, because you've standardized the alerting and the metrics and the security, and this is, it will just work if you're compliant, right? Um, the devil's in the details there, right? And we'll see how that, that plays out. There are early releases and there is some sample code and, you know, people saying that they're already compliant, even though the standards aren't complete. So, you know, we'll see how that plays out, but it does beg the question of, why are we doing this, right? Why are we right. virtualizing the edge, right? Are we really saving money? Uh, are we able to get power, you know, uh, savings? Because that's one of the biggest costs, as I mentioned on the, on the last uh, show was power at the edge is one of the biggest costs in operating these networks. So is there a way to get power savings? So even if I increase operational complexity, if I can get power savings, well, the cost of increasing operational complexity might be less than the cost of of the power. Uh, well, that's a good that point, I though. I mean, like a tightly integrated solution from a vendor is probably more optimal, probably has less computing power needed because general computing generally uses more power and has more, um, you know, more footprint, everything. We know from the deployments we built, right? Yeah, not you to know, mention that of... we know that power supplies, the, the 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 most efficient power supplies don't go to the Dells and the HPs and the, you know. Correct. Generally speaking, if I'm building purpose-built hardware, my power supply is going to be much Wait, more Wait, purpose-built the power supply when you build the machine. Right. I mean, I've done this before myself. Yeah, it's, right. and, you know, and then, you know, so that's one of the things that, that I've often wondered in this is that, is this, are we seeing the SDN movie again, right? We went down this road, remember at the beginning of SDN, I'll remind everybody that <laughs> one of the top two reasons for doing this was cost savings. And what's happened over time is vendors just dropped their pants and lowered the price, <laughs> right? You know, all the big router vendors still sell millions of copies of their hardware every year despite SDN existing, right? So, are, you know, is the, are, are, are we missing a point here with this thing? Yeah, so, again, I'm not sure that the cost savings in the hardware is the biggest driver, right? I think that there was discussions about that at first, really the operational costs are what we're trying to drive out here, right? And really the like power costs. costs. Yeah. yeah. Um, but haven't we made so that more expensive though? I mean, now you've, like operationally, you've you laid this out at the beginning. Like I've got six different vendors; they all got to <laughs> alarm the same way, orchestrate the same way, run on the same damn hardware with the same drivers. I mean, it's we bark it. Hence, why this is a conundrum <laughs> with no easy answer to give you as to whether I think this is a good idea or not. Right? Damn, now. we thought you were going to sort it out right here today. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it also really ties into that other meta point of your Shane about what does it even mean to be an operator now? Like, you know, it, it, if from a business standpoint, I could just offload this onto somebody else and make it their problem and be like, you run my network now. Like, <laughs> and, and the more people that do that and the more pressure I can apply to them, the lower I can squeeze the, the, their prices. Like, you know, and then, uh, and the barrier to entry then for being an operator is pretty low. Like, you know, hey, well, the barrier Netflix to entry to be an operator, operator becomes spectrum, right? right? It becomes, you know, and so that's the, that's the question of, is that what the real asset is? And I think the, the answer is when you see the, the prices that these auctions go for is that's the commodity or the, 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 the commodity in short supply is the actual spectrum to operate. And basically who operates your spectrum for you is sort of irrelevant at that point, right? I, I'm a kind of goes back to my comment about being a real estate holder. So now instead of being a tower real estate holder, you're a spectrum real estate holder. Um, but 
you know, it's not all doom and gloom. I think there are some areas where we get benefit out of this virtualization, right? Um, to, to go into two other areas that, that Tom mentioned. So you've got MEC, the mobile edge computing, which kind of brings this promise of taking, you know, the, the traditional data center, all my servers for hosting content are in a, a, a data center in, in Virginia, you know, uh, concept and pushes those out to the edge. So it kind of takes the CDN approach of distributing that content out to the edge. Um, but now I'm distributing it out to the far edge, maybe as far down as the actual cell site. Um, and allowing me to not just host my DU on those far edge servers, but host content there as well. So uh, for things like self-driving cars where I need to compute at the edge to do rapid calculations for LIDAR or radar or whatever, depending on, on you know, which, which team your self-driving car falls into. Um, the ability to, to push that calculations off into a, uh, a compute cluster that's sitting, you know, one millisecond away from you on, a, on a, the wireless network is pretty attractive. And that's that's in fact one of the promises of 5G, right? The low latency right. computing. This is an actual example of that, not you know AR, VR, whatever magic. This is an that's actual right. example. Um, healthcare is another uh, example, right? Like Being video push... surveillance, pre-processing, all that kind of right. you know. Um, you know, taking what it takes to do a, uh, to, to calculate a CAT scan and moving it into the cloud, but moving it at a very edge of the cloud so that I don't need to have huge compute clusters at hospitals to do, you know, you know, in rural hospitals to do CAT scans. I can have just, just the, you know, the, the essentially the far edge user equipment and then push the compute into the cloud. Uh, obviously gaming is another uh, big area where having this compute at the very far edge will, will, will pay dividends in terms of performance. Um, and, you know, that's, that's where Google has invested in the Stadia, right? Because, that's where they're seeing the value. Uh, so that's a big, big area of value that I think we'll see out of the, the, the edge virtualization. The other area where uh, there is value is in uh, private 5G networks. The ability to take what used to require a huge amount of hardware, boil it down into a bunch of servers and put it on site at a, a warehouse or a uh, you know, a campus, college campus. Well, also, own... the, the other thing, too, is in the operation space, right? You're, with with private 5G, you have the ability to combine user management. I mean, right. I don't know many, exactly. many people who want to run a radius server, <laughs> you know? Right. So, you know, people often say, well, why do I need a private 5G data network? I can just use Wi-Fi 6. Well... The admission control all and the ability to fine grain policy in, in, in 5G is far greater yep. than what's available in Wi-Fi. So, so just put them together and you've got one user record on the whole network and you're done. You know? Right. And that user record can roam when they leave Anywhere. your facility. Um, but you can apply policy to that user when they're on site in your facility. So you can just decide where they can call, what websites they can get to. But even beyond the human UE, when you get into the industrialization of factories, uh, yep, yep. the latency and admission control and guarantees that apply on a 5G network are far greater than what's available in Wi-Fi. So the ability to automate uh, your network is far greater when you've got- Far greater, you know, yeah. And the, yeah, the other thing too is, um, it's the it's the it's the kind of malleability of the of the setup is the, in the sense that like um, right. a, a friend of mine and I were talking about this the other day. He runs a bunch of manufacturing facilities in New Jersey, and th those are wired with you know whatever hundred meg Ethernet is what the machines and the, on the lines are all set up. And they want to add a new module effectively to this thing. They don't want to spend the money to drag because you actually have to shut the facility down or the section to rewire. You can't have technicians in there overhead and all that whilst this stuff's running. And so that's the beauty of, of the wireless solutions here is that everything can carry on and it's very less disruptive. 
uh, and future upgrades are just change the APs. You know, you're not rewiring anything, right? What's the up? What's the next upgrade after one gig Ethernet? You know, fiber. <laughs> you know, for long distances, so in factories and so to speak. So this is really a gem operationally, right? Right. And so I think that another another cool thing that you're describing, I think. But so when we think about data gravity, this idea of kind of processing the data towards the edge of the network, a lot of time that's that's in the constraints or through the lens of cost. So it costs so much money to move data in and out of the cloud. Here we're talking about performance edges. So I mean, just synchronicity and right. 5G alone, it's it's measured. I mean, it's probably up there with high frequency computing, right, Shane? I know you got a background in that as well. Ab absolutely. Probably yeah, I mean the timing back is. To that. <laughs> Timing is, is critical, right? And so, you know, we've seen uh, the move away from NTP as a, a timing source to things like PTP and Sync E because of the uh, performance that can be provided. Um, because, yeah, timing is everything in a, a wireless network, right? Uh, for admission control and for ensuring in, uh, in order delivery of, of data and, and things of that nature. Yeah, the, 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 the synchronicity is, is, is huge probably maybe even greater than high frequency trading um, because of the uh, time horizons on which you know some of these messages have to arrive so yeah or it so just it's not all work. doom and gloom <laughs> with with edge virtualization right it, it, to 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 uh to kind of recap it's not that i'm saying that there's not value that is being created it's just where the value is being created and what the value propositions are differ for every aspect of it. Um, for the consumer, it's likely long-term a good thing, right? And because it allows for greater flexibility and greater long-term penetration of uh, coverage into different areas and uh, new services to be created. From an operator perspective- ease of operation too. I mean, imagine, you know, imagine an enterprise that does an M&A and brings in another store. Hooking that store up is easier with this, a lot easier, right? right? It's It stays where it is. Basically, you, don't, you hardly change anything in the existing setup. You bring your APs, you plug them in, hand everybody a new SIM for their, their existing phones too, by the way. No hardware change there. If they're, you know, because you know, they'll do Wi-Fi, they'll do 4G and 5G. You know, if you do 5G subscriber management, it works for everything. And that's powerful. That's you know, way faster, way cheaper <laughs> than 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 the kind of manual way we've been doing it. Yeah, and even you know, there there's benefits of asset tracking because you know I can put now put a SIM card or an eSIM card into things and and track them through my factory, track my vehicles when you know when they're in the on the campus, track my vehicles when they're off the campus, all over one network. Well, we do but, this container tracking now too, like this. You, you right. put a little little battery, you know, little car battery uh, plus a transmitter inside of a container, and now I know everywhere it is, including if it fell into the ocean <laughs> <laughs> on the way here, you know. So, the, you know, the question though is for the operators: is is what the operational efficiency that will come from all of this? So, for the consumer, this is all a good thing. We're driving, you know, we're, we're pushing to drive down costs. We're pushing to drive in efficiency. But for the operator, the question becomes, am I actually achieving those? <laughs> and what yeah, is this additive or what am I doing? Yeah, that's really the, the question. No. Um, and, you know, the reality is we're already talking about 6G, which we're expecting to arrive in 2030. Next and year. And a lot yeah. of the lessons that we've already learned from, from 5G <laughs> uh, are being implemented to make things even, you know, even better. Um, so stay tuned for you know the net.lol in 2032 talking about uh, 6G implementation. We'll hopefully, still be here. And then hey, on that or... note, hey, on that note, we're actually up at the up against the clock here. Um, speaking of timing, um, do do you have any uh, like parting thoughts that that you want people to think about until the next time you're on? And, uh... <laughs> yeah. I, I think if I have any parting thoughts for an update soon, you know, in the near future, uh, is 
think about the operation, you know, think about how these pieces fit together. Think about how we can improve how they fit together. Uh, you know, certainly from an operator perspective, the, the challenges are, are, are great, but, you know, being like, like you said, all of us are sitting in places where we're, we're contributing to these, uh, these problems and these solutions is, is to think about, you know, not just how do I build a product, but how does it work in an ecosystem, right? And how does it work together? And am I really making things better or am I just adding to the pile? Or is it actually getting worse? Yeah. Well, on that thought, thanks. Thanks again for being on. It's uh, Thank you. always been a, always a pleasure having you on. And uh, do do uh, you guys have any 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 final things to say, my co-hosts, before we uh, we call it? All good. It's always great to have Shane on. Yeah, appreciate it. It's awesome. I appreciate you guys right. having me. Yeah, well, on that note, thanks thanks again for being on. And I want to uh, shout out to our uh, sponsor, T1 Nexus. Uh, thanks again for uh, sponsoring the program. And uh, that's uh, that's it for this episode. Thanks again for listening. Uh, I'm Tom on behalf of uh, Brent, Dave, and Kyle for the net.lol. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh.